it, it's kind of, there's not a whole, I'm still doing research on this. It's, it's, this is just the beginning of, of the topic. And I, and I know it's kind of maybe just the frame of, of what went on. But really, baseball in that era, it grew around the nation and it grew here. I think people tend to think, I don't know, it doesn't seem, you know, we don't have a whole lot of minor league clubs and a whole lot where we're a, a state of small towns that baseball may not be as vibrant here as it was in other regions of the country. But my research indicates that's not the case at all. Baseball was very, very popular after the Civil War as it is now here. Now that kind of dovetails into my next little snippet of discussion is where I played vintage baseball and kind of just in a, in a primer on vintage baseball. I know that we've talked about it and I'll, I'll kind of maybe just give a brief introduction to what vintage baseball is. There are roughly 450 vintage teams that play vintage baseball around the United States. And they play rule from rules based in the 1850s all the way to the turn of the 20th century. We play by the rules, the equipment, and the customs of that era. Uniforms, everything, we try to be as era correct as possible. My team, the Bluegrass Barons, we play rules codified in 1865, the fly rule. I said earlier, talking about the fly rule and the bound rule. In the early years of Major League Baseball, sorry, in the early years of baseball, pardon me, the game was played by what we call the bound rule. Any ball caught on one bounce, either fair territory or foul territory, if it was caught on one bounce, it was considered an out. That was, that was an out, that's a hand out. And there was a lot of discussion, a lot of rancor about this rule. It was not popular. Some clubs tended to not have the most talented players like it because it helped, helped them feel in fielding. You know, that, that, that was a big boost for them. But the more competitive clubs, they, they, they were disgusted with it. They called it a childish rule, they called it the boys rule. The manly fly game is what they wanted to play. And some of the better clubs, before the, the change from the bound of the fly rule, started playing the fly rule in exhibitions just to show that, show what the potential of this rule was. But in 1864, for the 1865 season, the, fly, the bound rule went away with the exception of balls caught in foul territory. Um, vintage baseball, so, but you'll have teams who play by the bound rule and teams who play by the fly rule. We play by the fly rule. Most clubs in the Cincinnati area, because of the influence of the 1869 Red Stockings, tend to play by the fly rule and, and try to tend to play in that 1869 era. If you go down to Tennessee, where they have a vibrant vintage baseball league going on, the vintage, Tennessee Vintage Baseball Association, I highly recommend you follow them. They have 12 clubs, and they are, I look on them with a great amount of respect with what they've been able to do. But they play by the bound rule, but they play it very, very well. Uh, but you have, it's it really clubs, they play by what rules they want to, you know, what, what makes best sense for them. But we try to recreate what baseball was. Where, how, you know, it shows that when you come out to a game, what you hope you do, you get to see what the game was and, and how it got to where it is now. You kind of see the evolution of the game. Um, I guess that being said, what kind of questions would you, do you have any kind of questions I could answer or entertain? Regarding vintage baseball or baseball in Kentucky? How long have you been a member of the Barons? Uh, 2015. We, we, are, we played the first games in 2016, but we started. We were founded in 2015. We started practicing. Uh, we play about 25 games a year, but I've been here since the very start. I, I tried to form my own team in Frankfurt, but it's hard. It's surprisingly hard to get people to want to play. You know, they, they, they want to come out and watch. When you ask them, do you want to play? Some people, I don't, not, not so much. I think. I think a lot of people, they don't like the idea of trying to catch a ball with their bare hands, but that's, it's, it's trust me, it's, it's not a, <laughs> you get used to it really quick. Um, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you tell us more about the rules? Sure. And, and what is the game? Okay. I would like to know. Absolutely. <laughs> with, with, the 18, with, with the rules of that era, they were a little bit different than they are now. Pitchers actually pitched underhand. And, and it's... Early on, it was uh, just trying to get a pitch a ball over the plate that would get a, something for the batter to hit. But by the 1850s, it was, we had pitchers like James Creighton, early 1860s time frame, their goal was to pitch fast and to produce bad contact or strike the batter out if they could. So really by the eight, early 1860s, you had strikeout baseball and induced bad contact baseball by the pitcher. In the 1857 rules for 1858, you had, the, what, you had the first called strikes. Before then, a pitcher or a batter could wait all day to, to, to hope, in the hopes that the catcher would drop the ball and a, and a guy on base could advance because the catcher left the catch. 
they did baseball determined that we need to have the, the National Association of Baseball Players said we need to have a rule that stops this because we have pitchers at times throwing an in, in excess of 900 pitches in a game, oh my God. which it, 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 most major league pitchers now 120 pitches and they're trying to pull them because they don't want to damage the arm. That even though with an underhand, which is a more natural motion, that's still an incredible amount of throwing. Right. And they said we've got to stop this. Games are lasting too long. We have guys throwing 900 pitches. This is ridiculous. So the umpire is empowered after a warning to call strikes. They you warn the batsman, say you need to swing. You know you've been warned. Now you need to swing at pitches that are considered hittable. But the problem with that is, is there was no real strike zone. It was from you know, the umpire. If it was to him a hittable ball, he could call a strike on it if, if, after you were warned. So you had that was a first evolution of the rules. Uh, strikers, there is if you come to where we when one of our games, we have a disc for home plate and you have a line through it. The batter was to straddle that line, one leg over, one leg behind, and he would and that's where he would swing. Uh, you would have. As I said, balls caught in foul territory on one bounce up until the 1870s were considered out, even with the advent of the fly rule. Uh, stealing was, it was called advancing at that time. Mm -hmm. So that was common, there was nothing against that. You'd hear people say, well, stealing didn't, wasn't a thing until this such a thing. Stealing was part of the game from the earliest days, as was leading off, as was defensive shifts. You know, they would, players, you know, as I said, by the 1860s, teams were trying to win. There were, there were no rules prohibiting shifts, prohibiting leading off, prohibiting stealing. Those were all part of the game back then. The game, I, I think we tend to think, oh, you know, it's an idealized past. You know, baseball was a friendly affair. Everyone loved one another. No. <laughs> no, it was as competitive then as it is now. Teams were trying to angle to win. They wanted to win championships. They wanted to win games. They wanted to be the best club in their area, you know, just like we do now. But, um, you know, in the 18, more on the rules in 1864 rules, the first balls were called, you know, you, you, for pitchers who were trying to, to go too far and reduce bad contact, throw bad pitches, they were told, we'll start calling balls on you. And the number of balls to produce a base on balls very fluctuated wildly in the, in the 19th, 19th century. At one point, I think there were nine balls for a walk in the 1880s. You went up from that far, you went from three, not as low as three to as many as nine. In 1887, walks counted as hits, so you had the highest batting average of all time was in the 450, but that was inflated by a lot of walks. Uh, adjusted, it's, he, he batted, the, bat, the guy batted over 400, but still, it's a big fluctuation. So the rules of that era, it was all in an attempt to make the game better. Um, the pitcher at one point was, he, he initially was about 40, what we consider 45 feet away, and he, he pitched where there was no mound, it was just you pitched on a flat surface, you know, to, to the batter. In the 18, they started moving it back to 50 feet, then 55, then the 60 feet, six inches we have now was in the early 1890s. They moved to that because pitching had become so dominant, it had depressed batting averages so greatly. So really, with in rules in that era, it was just it was a matter of evolution. You, you had it was just a matter of trying one thing, trying different things to try to make the game. Always try to make the game better, I guess. Is or are there any other rules you might want to maybe I can answer for you? Or? Yeah, that's okay. very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm nervous. Well, so okay, yeah. so you mentioned that they, the uh, umpire started giving a warning, and then it meant if you didn't swing, he would call you a strike. Right? He would start calling strikes if the pitches were what he deemed was hittable. He would then start calling strikes. Well, well it's totally his discretion. Totally, it, it, and that caused a lot of controversy because. You know what he what he might consider hittable, another empire might say yeah, that's you know it's like kind of like today. I mean, there is more, much of course, much more guidelines. But an umpire, one umpire might see his strikes might be a little bit wider than another's. Well, were there a number of strikes for an out? Yes, three strikes were still an out. They said three strikes mm -hmm. would be an out. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I, I that that was <laughs> thank you for let, let me clarify that. Yes, three strikes were an out. Mm -hmm. And of course, even in that era, if a drop third strike happened, the batter was. Obligated to run the first base, you know. To, now, if you have a drop third strike, it, it's a it's a live ball. The batter the, the batter can run. You back then, it was the same way. Any more questions? Uh, I do have another question. Sure. Um, you mentioned the financial instability of the, a lot of the minor leagues at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I've read a little bit about some of the Negro leagues at the time, 
and um, it seems like financial instability was a huge thing there where players were playing for three or four teams during the year because teams would just fold you know, during the season. Um, when did that stop being an issue for the minor leagues, do you know? Well, I, I think really, in a way, I guess I would say in the fi by the 50s. Okay. Because okay. things, with really the television, this is going to sound harsh, but television kind of killed minor league baseball. Where you had all manner of minor leagues before this, well, that in the Second World War itself, because obviously with manpower shortages. Yeah. But you had a lot of leagues that would start up in a season, and even in the 30s and 40s, especially with the Depression, and they would collapse because they were the the team owners were more optimistic than their bank accounts would allow. But by the 50s and 60s, that tended to be more stable. You still had leagues collapse and teams collapse in that era, but really by that time, things were much more solid. You know, you, you were playing in areas that had shown themselves they would support a minor league club, like a Louisville or eventually a Lexington. They would come out and they would spend their money and the teams were less apt to collapse and fold than they had been in the early part of the century, which really has added to the stability of all of baseball. Do you think that there was a correlation with the um, the fact that minor league teams were affiliated with major league teams? That did help. Um, that started in the 1920s. Uh, Branch Rickey, he ran the St. Louis Cardinals, and they were a very cash-strapped club. They were very money poor, and he and he and minor league clubs made their money by selling players to the major leagues. And they, if teams would get into bidding wars with these players. And they could command high prices for very talented ball players, and you could really fund your season by if you had a good player, you could really make a major league team pay for him if you really wanted to. And Branch Rickey with the Cardinals, they could not they could not compete. You know, they they somehow managed to get Rogers Hornsby before they for the for a farm system, but otherwise they were not getting the best players, and their records from the early 20th century showed that they were not a very good club when Branch Rickey took over. But his concept of the farm system was. We could, we could have affiliates, we could pay for affiliates, and we could develop our own talent instead of having to pay massive amounts of money. We're talking, we're talking in some players in that era, $50,000, and that money from that era for a single ball player. Instead of having to pay that, we will have these networks of affiliates. We can de control the development of these players and not have to pay these massive fees for, um, for developing and perpetuating talent for our major league club. And that's really, that really did help because you had Major League, in a way that did help because you had the stability of Major League Baseball to kind of guide it, but also at the same time these clubs were not getting the massive amounts of money for selling contracts that they once did. But, and then, but, but yes, I, you, you are exactly right in, in, in regarding that the farm systems really stabilized minor league baseball, I think. I have one more question. Sure, absolutely. Um, you said that you tried to, um, with your uniforms, be as you know, era accurate as possible, and um, your your catching um, balls without gloves. Is that what you said? Yes, ma'am. Um, and you're the catcher. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you wear no gear? No, no, ma'am. Uh, the first catching gear did not really develop until the 1870s, uh, late 1870s. You have a catcher's mask, and the chest protector would come, came out not long afterward. But cat in, in the mitts, they had gloves by then as well, but they were fingerless gloves, they weren't mitts, so you wouldn't have mitts till really later on in the 19th century. And they wouldn't get shin guards till the, after the 20th century. But yeah, I, we're not throwing really hard. We're, you know, we're not, we're not <laughs> trust me. We're, 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 not, we're, not, we're not throwing like they were in the late 1860s. And well, I mean, even with a foul tip. Yeah. That, that is a risk of the, yeah, that is a definitely a risk of the position. Right, because I mean, like, you know, you're not wearing a helmet or anything, so if you get a foul tip, it could hit you in the head. Right, and, and I try to, and we set, I stand enough back to where it gives me a little bit of room to maneuver with it. I, I'm not, ca, ca, the catching position has evolved. We're, we're, we're they're almost right on top of the batter now. Right. We're, I'm about, I'd say, like about three, three feet, three to five feet, feet yeah. behind the batter. It gives me a little bit of space to work with in order to catch. And you're, you're more stand, not yeah. standing, yeah. but. The Not catch, way down. The catcher position, I tend to feel like this. Yeah. And, and catchers really didn't go into the full crouch until the 20th century. So I'm kind of standing like this. It gives me some, you know, I'm not, gives me a little more maneuverability than if I were crouching under the back. If he has to get away. Yeah, if, <laughs> I, if, I, have to, if I have to run away, I can, I can get away. <laughs> Is the umpire right behind you? He's more off to the side. Okay. 
and see if um, you move backwards either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can move backwards. Unless there's like a backstop or hay bale 